So my name is Patricia Kozik and I'm a group leader at the LMB um, since 2016. Um, I did my undergraduate in Germany uh, at the Jakobs University and then I came here for a PhD with uh, Scotty Robinson which was at the CIMR next door. Um, that lasted a bit longer than planned but after that I got the Sir Henry Welcome Fellowship which is sort of this collaborative uh, fellowship to work at the Institute Curie in Paris with Sebastian Amigorena at the Broad Institute with Nia Hakohen and at the LRI with Catherine uh, Risi Souza. So that was for four years. Um, I didn't quite uh, do the whole four years and I came here um, a little bit, I think, sort of three years into the fellowship. We are working on dendritic cells, which are these cells that reside in uh, all the tissues in the body and they act as um, sentinels of the immune system. So they survey the environment and they look for signals of danger. And when they encounter either some uh, molecules from viruses or from bacteria or potentially some molecules produced by cancer, they go into the lymph nodes and then they activate immune cells, the lymphocytes, to become cytotoxic killer cells. And these cells can then go and kill the cancer cells or infected cells. So we're basically work, trying to work out the molecular details of what happens inside these dendritic cells to allow them to start the immune response. I don't think I sort of grew up thinking about science as such a lot. I asked a lot of questions about everything, um, but I don't think I was sort of really familiar with the scientific culture um, as such. So. Maybe that's not necessarily a sort of um, my earliest memory of um, a discovery, but I remember one of the lectures when I was an undergraduate, and we talked about how proteins are transported around the, uh, through the Golgi complex. And um, sort of our lecturer at the time asked us this question of how do we think it happens? And basically at the time it wasn't really clear. So I got really excited that we're actually learning about something that's not known. So um, yeah, I think it was the first, the first sort of um, experience of, of you know, getting, getting to sort of learn, learn something that's um, still being investigated. And I got really interested in that. And I ended up then doing internship on that topic. The reason why I sort of ended up working on, a, on vesicle trafficking in the first place is because in my first uh, year of undergraduate, we had to pick a topic from a hat to write an essay. And I picked this topic on vesicles and I was already quite excited about this Golgi complex and trafficking. So I was very excited that you know, the other topics in the hat were like about bumblebees and completely different things. So because I actually randomly picked something I really liked, I made an effort writing the essay and that gave me my first student job in that field. So, you know, I think there were a lot of random things that happened, someone I ran into that suggested I could apply for this job and this and that. So um, I kind of just try to be open to opportunities that come up and not be sort of too set on a specific pathway. So I did my PhD in uh, protein trafficking, so how proteins move around the cell and what are the mechanisms that sort of allow proteins to, to function, to, to get to the right compartment where they can function. And this was basic cell biology, so we worked with these HeLa cells, which are cells that are derived from you know, a lady who had a cancer in the 70s and they somewhat um, unethically at the time took her cells and ended up growing them and now everyone is using these cells. So it's not a very sort of um, physiological cell system. And I got really interested in how immune cells adapt these different trafficking pathways to do their very specific functions. So for example, the killer cells, they have to secrete things that will kill the target cells. The dendritic cells that I work on, they have very uh, robust sort of system of so-called endocytic vesicles. So they take up everything they found in the environment and then inside these vesicles, they sort of analyze it. And I've been really interested in, I'm really interested in how this different cell biological pathways are being used by the immune system. So um, dendritic cells are quite exciting in that sense because they have quite important role in initiation of the immune responses. They are targets for immunotherapy. So in, in a way, it's, we're not doing applied research, but you know, it has 
some potential applications for vaccination, for immunotherapy, but at the same time we can study these very basic molecular processes and sort of try to understand how things happen on this very sort of detailed level, which I quite enjoy. Right now we're very uh, excited about uh, the spore forming protein that we have recently discovered. So there's been this question in the field for about 30 years probably now of how proteins can escape from endocytic compartments into the cytosol. So it's a pathway that's unique to dendritic cells, which is again sort of one of these examples of how certain pathways can actually be quite specific to different cell types. And uh, we invested quite a lot of time to develop an, a new assay in order to study this process. And quite surprisingly for us at the time, we found this protein that's actually very similar to a protein made by T cells in order to kill the target cells. And dendritic cells make a very similar pore forming protein, which you can actually <laughs> see in the background, um, in order to um, activate the T cells. So we are now trying to understand how do they control its activity because the T cell performing protein kills, whereas the neurotic cells make loads of that protein, but actually they survive, so they use it for a very specific pathway. And so that's, um, so for us, it's sort of very interesting now to try to work out all the details of how this protein actually contributes to the immune responses, but also how the cells manage to control its activity. It's always little steps in the end that move the research forward, I think. We do a lot of genetic screens, which means there's a long, long, long time when we're setting the assays up and setting the experiments up. And then you do your screen. So basically you sort of screen hundreds or thousands of genes and you try to find the ones that are relevant for your process. So usually that's the most exciting part of the project because that's sort of the biggest step forward in most of the projects. You uh, until then, you, uh, you, you don't really know what you will end up working with. Uh, but other than that, usually it's, you know, it's every experiment gives you like a little bit more information and, um, and usually you move one step forward and then discover even more questions. So um, I, think, I think usually it's, it's, the research goes much, it's much, more, it's much slower than, you know, than this eureka moment that we often imagine at least um, for us. <laughs> so we work on the immune system and how the immune responses are um, controlled by dendritic cells. And LMB is a laboratory of molecular biology. So a lot of the research here is very molecular, very uh, focused on protein structures, sort of cell biology, much more uh, detailed than immunology normally is. So. I really enjoy being here as an immunologist because it sort of allows us to address the questions we are studying from a very different perspective because you're sort of forced to think about your question from this molecular side. And we can also benefit from all the different assays that have been developed to work on these uh, molecular um, problems to this more complex system of um, how the immune systems, uh, immune cells work together. So I think for me, being here is, is sort of, it's really interesting to be in this somewhat different environment, uh, trying to address uh, how, um, yeah, how, trying to address this, this more immunological question. I mean, obviously LMB is an excellent place full of really amazing scientists. So that's uh, really motivating and uh, inspiring, but, um, yeah, but also from a more practical point of view, I really, uh, I think it really sort of makes our science somewhat different by being surrounded by people who think maybe somewhat differently than your field generally does. I think to be a good scientist, you need to be really willing to accept the fact that a lot of the experiments would, won't work, right? So, and not to be discouraged by negative results because Everything is, the things that are interesting are usually quite difficult. So it takes a long time to get an answer to any question. And a lot of the experiments will fail. And especially if you sort of embark on a more ambitious project, then there is a lot of setting up and a lot of, a lot of work until you actually discover something. So I think one of the more important things is, is sort of this resilience to accept the fact that it's not like, you know, there isn't often a right answer on how to do the experiments. We just don't know. And I think that's a big shift from, being a student to, to sort of doing research. 
And I think other than that, it's, it's really just sort of being critical about the data and asking questions and trying to sort of not be too biased by your how you would like things to be, <laughs> which is always harder than, you know, we always have our favorite model and we kind of hope that this is going to all come true with, with, and we'll be able to, to prove that uh, hypothesis is correct. But I think it's really important to be very critical with your own data. I think there's one thing that surprised me when I started being a group leader is that you sort of transition from this being in the lab and being surrounded by people to spending a lot of time in your office. And I found it really hard in the beginning because um, it just felt really lonely in a way. So at the same time, I think one of the surprising things about science is that it is much more sort of social and interactive than we often think because a lot of the ideas come sort of from talking to the people and uh, you know we spend a lot of time sort of collaborating and discussing the research. So I think, um, yeah, I think science is becoming definitely way more collaborative these days than it used to be. I think if you want to do a research career, you have to be really excited about the research itself because a lot of um, research is difficult by sort of its nature, right? We're working on something that we don't understand how it works. So you have to be sort of willing to kind of jump in and just accept the fact that a lot of the time you spend being frustrated by not being able to solve a problem. So I think as long as you're really excited about the questions you're trying to address, then, um, then it feels it's worth it. So I would say, I think, find something that you're really excited about and then you know, take it from there. <laughs>